When new technologies emerge, it is always an important question how to allow the market that they enable to express itself and how, if regulators need to intervene in order to make sure that the market is healthy uh, with a plurality of players uh, competing in order to provide the best possible service uh, to those that use uh, the products in this new market. Is it possible to uh, see and, and find examples where the regulators uh, provided the right kind of incentives? Is it possible to find other examples uh, where the regulators uh, apparently failed and the market finds itself in a situation that is certainly less than optimal? Yes, examples are plentiful. And sometimes, uh, as it happens, uh, these examples clarify and maybe provide some guidance for the future, but probably they are not a perfect recipe for understanding what should be done. So what is the role of uh, the new technologies? They certainly uh, change uh, the rules of the game. Um, they uh, make abundant something that was previously scarce and um, whether we are talking about uh, physical resources or access to some kind of service. Also, the new technologies make uh, business models possible where um, the relationship between suppliers uh, and uh, intermediary producers and, the cons and consumers gets completely restructured. And uh, uh, finally, of course, most importantly, new technologies make novel products and services possible. Things that uh, literally look magical uh, if we were able to see them uh, with the eyes of the past. So, on to some examples. The European telecommunications market used to be extremely fragmented and extremely expensive. Um, even though mobile phones uh, took root uh, in Europe and got adopted faster in the 90s than, uh, for example, in the United States, with both uh, handsets and services, uh, this uh, innovation uh, slowed down. Uh, I remember uh, that uh, I would uh, travel to the US uh, and uh, look at the uh, local choices available, both in terms of the contracts that carriers would provide and in terms of the handsets available, and they would be tremendously inferior in the 90s than not uh, what was available uh, in Europe. Not only uh, the variety of handsets uh, provided, for example, by the likes of Nokia, but uh, uh, also the business novel innovation originated by Omnitel in Italy of the prepaid scratch card based uh, um, contract. Well, actually no contract, just your ability to pay 20, 40, whatever amount of, uh, um, well, then it wasn't even euros, right? Local currency in the various countries uh, and uh, make uh, the uh, calls in minutes that was correspondent uh, to that amount uh, was uh, able to bring a new generation of uh, mobile phone users uh, that wouldn't underwrite uh, a monthly uh, payment for one or two years uh, uh, contractual obligation otherwise. Then uh, the uh, announcement uh, of uh, the iPhone uh, completely appended uh, everything. And uh, in terms of um, handsets, uh, uh, Europe uh, fell behind. Uh, no one uh, until Android came along uh, uh, with uh, a, a wide variety of hardware producers uh, could compete with the uh, iPhone. But what happened uh, in, in Europe is interesting because 
As uh, the European Union tries to integrate its uh, market uh, ever more tightly, uh, the uh, opportunity was there to uh, step in for the regulator and make sure that uh, communications between uh, the member states uh, would not be hampered by antiquated understandings of how the interconnection fees should be charged among players and then typically uh, passed on to the consumers. So basically the regulator said, listen guys to the carriers, um, I give you a given number of years, after that you cannot uh, have consumers pay roaming charges if they are calling from one country in the EU to another country or vice versa or when they are traveling they have to get the same um, service and the same charges regardless of where they are within the EU. This is very reasonable and very advantageous both to consumers and businesses who uh, are not exposed to the complications and asking themselves oh i will have this extra cost if i am calling this person or i will be traveling i need to buy a local sim card and swap it out and so on and so forth and it is a fantastic step in the right direction for enhancing uh, the uh, collaboration and the business uh, opportunities and tourism and everything else uh, within uh, the countries belonging to the European Union. Of course, uh, in the United States it is uh, like this and it has been for a long time. Uh, the types of uh, um, uh, contracts that uh, you uh, sign with carriers do not include a long list of uh, uh, states uh, uh, to call to Massachusetts, it's uh, this much to call to Texas, is this much. If you travel to California, you uh, will spend this much in data and that much uh, in, in, in mobile minutes and so on. None of that uh, crazy complication uh, would be understandable and it would severely hamper uh, the healthy development uh, of the communications market. Um, I don't know right now, but last time I was in India, it was still a case that you couldn't get an Indian mobile phone. You would only get a mobile phone of the state where uh, you were traveling. And if you then, you know, this is a huge subcontinent, uh, a huge country of uh, over a billion people. If you then flew from New Delhi to Mumbai or uh, uh, you went to Goa or uh, very well else, your phone number uh, either would stop working or you would end up paying roaming charges or you would have to resort to uh, buy a new SIM card and, and change phone number. Well, except if you had, like I uh, had, the uh, uh, Google Fi service, which uh, with a single card was uh, even then able to uh, provide very, very low cost communication, uh, overcoming the, these local uh, quirks. And you can imagine if India were able to adopt uh, uh, the kind of regulation that across all the states of the nation would eliminate these uh, roaming charges, uh, it would be an extremely positive development for uh, the country, both for consumers and for businesses. And at the end, of course, also for the carriers themselves, who would see the numbers of people who adopt third, fourth and fifth uh, generation uh, network services and uh, uh, handsets uh, uh, really blossom. Another example uh, is uh, pretty uh, important to my friend uh, Corey uh, Doktorov and uh, to millions of people who enjoy audiobooks. Today, uh, audiobooks and podcasts 
have seen uh, a blossoming uh, because uh, when people do their chores at home or commute at work or in many other uh, ways, uh, listening to them is enjoyable, convenient, uh, you learn a lot, you follow a great story or a great storyteller. However, uh, Amazon with its Audible unit uh, it dominates uh, the audiobook uh, category with a type of exclusive licensing that hampers competition and uh, under uh, cuts uh, eliminates uh, existing services such as the ability for libraries to lend uh, their uh, collections uh, to the patrons that uh, visit uh, their, 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 their offices or their buildings, whether physically or digitally. Um, and Corey uh, launched his uh, latest book, um, Attack Surface, uh, on a Kickstarter, especially to break this uh, stronghold of Amazon uh, so that uh, um, as many people as possible would pay for an audiobook that is not uh, on uh, Audible in order to show his publisher that it is possible not to adopt the Audible contract of exclusive um, uh, audiobook uh, distribution, but it is possible for his publisher uh, to support authors that want to make their books uh, in audiobook format to be available uh, everywhere. Now, I supported Corey's uh, Kickstarter and Corey was also a guest on Searching for the Question Live where we spoke about this uh, in depth. But the reason I mentioned this example is because the emerging market of audiobooks and podcasts may see uh, the necessity of a regulator stepping in because of the market's failure to stop monopolistic practices to be uh, enforced uh, by these exclusive contracts that uh, do not benefit the author, the publisher and the public. For example, uh, if I am blind and I want to go uh, to a public library and uh, go home with an audio tape, uh, I can do that and listen to the audio tape of I don't know what uh, uh, author from the past. But if I go to the library and I want to uh, ask for the audiobook of a modern author, the library cannot lend it to me, I cannot listen to it and uh, my opportunity to participate in modern culture is severely restricted uh, and hampered by this uh, lack of competition, lack of choice, uh, and due uh, to the lack of intervention from the regulator uh, that let the monopolistic practice uh, to uh, entrench itself uh, in the market. So these are uh, reasons for uh, the, the regulator to actually uh, act and uh, to do it uh, rapidly. Of course, the regulator is uh, in a difficult situation because new technologies uh, are difficult to understand by the practitioners themselves, let alone policymakers whose job is, is uh, across the board horizontally for any technology, not just one. They cannot be a specialist in that. They rely on the lobbyists telling them what are the best practices, what are the outcomes. And of course, those lobbyists uh, do not represent the public interest in general. They represent specialized interests. So through these examples, I hope I illustrated that uh, the choice is there, uh, how and when to intervene, sometimes to intervene rapidly, but always to make sure that any regulation that is implemented contains sunset clauses that force uh, the policymaker to revisit, measure the effect of the regulation, update it, and then implement it anew with an improved uh, set of incentives and conditions so that 
the market can adopt the new technology and the choices can flourish and multiply and we get to enjoy uh, improved products and services in the future as well.